19. 10 minutes later, Zook finally breaks the silence in the car. Are you freaking kidding me? Paul's decision has, at least him, if not them both, nervous. Neither can see a wolf running behind or to the side of them after checking a few times, they are fairly sure, but they have underestimated them before. He has dealt with some of their kind some time ago before the recent big fight, but he still didn't know why there is such a feud between wolves and their kind. Paul answers. I couldn't look like a little bitch in front of him, everything is fine, he expected something from us, and he gets it. Paul has a smile on his face, but Zook knows that if his heart could beat, it would be going a mile a minute. Paul continues. They'll respect us more for it, sure they'll be mad, but they won't be able to do a damn thing. Zook finishes, whatever this is, shaking his head. You didn't want to look like a little bitch, so you sucker headbutt a werewolf? Do that all you want on your own time, but not while you are riding in my car. In Zook's mind, these physical types of vampires always push it too far, and get themselves into trouble, always thinking they are better than others. He has no idea why Paul didn't keep the massacre in mind from when the Fang made their stand. He usually wouldn't have cared, as long as he wouldn't be involved with irritating them, but it certainly would be guilt by association if they see any more. He'd have to try to get away from Paul when he gets a chance. Not long later, they pull into a large compound, gated, guarded, and for the two, a bit. Much. Sure, someone rich and powerful lives here, and neither of them would choose this sort of scene if they were the boss of a city, but, to each their own. But is driving, he pulls up to a gate with a large turnaround lot and enough room to fit the large town car close to it. Bud lets the window slide down and checks out the guards, they are from a certain company and they were not in suits and ties, but collared shirts and khakis and shoes to chase someone down. They are alert and paying attention. Bud starts. We are from. The guard speaks. You are expected. The gate slides open, and they wait a few seconds. Bud continues to drive as he is waved in. On the way down the path to a large mansion, there are a couple of guard shacks down either side of the path, and a few more darted around the property, Zook and Paul look through the tinted windows and notice all were manned with disciplined people paying attention, two guards at each location with rifles and swords. The two in the car look at each other, Zook notes that the place looks like a military compound. Something must have stirred them up. Paul nods in agreement. There is no mistaking it, they are being driven to a, smaller scale version of the White House, in the nation's capital. The place is perhaps half of the size and height, there are no columns at the front center, nor nearly as many windows, but the place gives them an eerie feeling. There is also an added building to one side, adding on what looks like a large garage. There are two large garage doors, one on either side of a long building, a single window in the middle with bars bolted over the front of it. As Bud drives closer, the road veers off to the right, and loops around in front of the home. There are parking spaces along the outside of the house, and as they pull up, they see another set coming into view. Bud stops the car at the front door. Three of the parking spaces have cars in them. A man and a woman, dressed in finery, stand under a pavilion at the bottom of the steps, and walk to either side of the car. The man speaks to the side of the car. May we open your doors for you? The doors unlock electrically from the front. Before the woman attendant can open the side door farthest from the extravagant building, Paul opens his door on the opposite side of the car, while Zook waits, allowing the man to open his side. Both the man and woman bow, keeping their eyes averted as Zook and Paul step out of the car. Neither attendant looks directly at their faces. The man says, You are expected. Please enter and follow signs to the Grand Hall. As they walk up the stairs, someone opens the front door for them. 
Entering the opulent building, they find the interior is equally lavish, with gold-plated moldings and surfaces. Paintings line the walls, and a polished plaque hangs next to a coat check room. Inside, a guard sits attentively, watching the new guests and waiting to assist. The plaque next to the coat room is a basic map, the metal looks like a shiny copper, and the etchings are of a map and letters around the map are another grey metal. Paul asks. So, what do you do if the map needs to change, or if the room purposes change, for the boss's decision? In response, the guard says. It is melted down and reworked, management spares no expense. May I take your coats? Both shake their heads, glancing at the plaque, which lists rooms like the game room, grand hall, pool, kitchen, library, bedroom number one, and two bathrooms. They proceed to another area marked as security on the map. Behind a thick glass window, a person sits in a recliner, watching as they walk past. Through a speaker, they hear. Good evening. You both must answer to continue. Do you intend to harm anyone at this gathering? I see two of you. Are there more with you? Zook replies. I intend no harm here, and it's just the two of us. Paul pauses looking at the person in the recliner. Do you intend us any harm? The voice responds. That isn't how this works, sir. Please answer the questions. I want to know if you intend us any harm. It doesn't exactly seem fair if you get your answers and I don't. Zook nudges him and whispers. Just answer. We're guests. Even if this one doesn't intend to harm us, others could. Paul nods at Zook's reasoning and answers. I have no bad intentions toward anyone here, and it's just the two of us and the driver outside. The watcher presses a button, and an automatic door slides open, allowing them into another hall with rooms on either side and stairs to a second floor, roped off at the base. They walk through the large hall, noting small plaques on each door. Passing other rooms, they finally find the grand hall and, for the first time, open the door themselves. Inside, the room is stunning, perhaps ostentatious or extravagant. Golden trimming and lavish fixtures adorn the walls. Zook notices the white paint looks special, possibly eggshell or alabaster. Between the windows, paintings hang in frames intricately handcrafted without machine work. Zook can tell each is unique, the handiwork obvious even at a glance. The artwork itself is intriguing, but he doesn't have time to dwell on each piece. Paul, however, scans the room carefully, and spots a painting that transfixes him. He wanders to it and gets within feet of it, even removes his rose-colored sunglasses, a rare gesture Zook has only seen once. Paul stretches his hand as if to touch it, either drawn to the painting's essence, or doubting his own perception of the skill of the artist. It takes a few snaps of Zook's fingers, to pull Paul back to reality. Three tables arranged in a C-shape occupy the room, each topped with an immaculate tablecloth, except the middle one, which is slightly scuffed. Six others are present, three in casual attire, two in fine suits, and one in black jeans and an open leather jacket with no shirt, casually sitting on a table. Though his boots aren't muddy, his choice of seating is offensive to the pristine tabletop. The man in leather, seated confidently in a large chair, beams when the newcomers enter. Hey guests! He shouts, waving off those around him to approach, Zook, and Paul. He extends a hand to Zook, who recoils slightly and raises an arm, questioning. Whoa! Whoa! What are you doing? The man drops his arm, turning serious. Just coming to shake your hand, you can gauge a man's intentions from a handshake. Sure, you could, back when we were alive. Now you and I both know our intentions. You haven't killed us yet, and your people have been cautious. I don't know if you intend to crush my hand or draw my blood. Let's keep our distance. 
the man turns to Paul, who stoically keeps his arms crossed. Zook asks. We're here from out of town for a reason. How much info did you get? A suited man introduces himself as Jensen, the record keeper. He then gestures to the man in leather, introducing him as George Mason, the boss. We know what you likely need and can update you. Could you tell us any details? We're tracking a colleague who might have passed through here, probably with hunters. If they kill her, we are to respond accordingly. Jensen begins to reply, but George interjects. A hunter group recently attacked us. Not strong, but we tracked them to a warehouse. They escaped before we arrived. If you want to pursue hunters, we'll share what we've found. Jensen can give you the address. Red flags go up for Zook. What's the catch? We need bodies. Wolves have been encroaching. Zook and Paul raise their hands in front of them. Whoa. They say in unison. Zook continues. The wolves rarely encroach, unless provoked. If someone's pressing into their territory for development, that's not our fight. We all know it. George's expression sours, but he replies in a deep tone. You won't need to fight, just show our strength. Nope. There's no superiority over wolves. Investigating a hunter hideout is not comparable to a werewolf discussion. Anything else? If you help, I'll provide the address right after our meeting with the wolves tomorrow night. Otherwise, finding it alone and bribing those who we have on payroll will take nights. Come on, there is nothing to it. Zook signals for a moment to confer with Paul. They pull out their phones to communicate discreetly. Zook texts. What do you think? I'd rather avoid losing nights, but this boss is trouble. Paul chuckles aloud at Zook's text and replies. We're here for Zant and Tina's in danger. Let's go along, look tough, and bail if things get rough. Zook replies. These wolves are serious. You can't just run from them. Paul responds. We'll just stand there, won't even need to speak. They rarely negotiate with us anyway. Zook looks back, and addresses the rest of them. Can anyone use blood magic to make our faces hard to recognize? We'll be there but want to remain inconspicuous. George glances at Jensen, who nods and makes arrangements. Zook texts Paul. We can look tough, scope out the warehouse, and hopefully avoid conflict. Paul agrees and texts back. Fine. It's better than sitting around in a car all night. Let's do this. Turning back to George, Zook asks. Can we hunt, or are there volunteers? We want more blood if we're near werewolves. Of course, you can drink here. The pool area and game room have guests who might volunteer. Respect any who decline, and no overfeeding. Thank you. And my driver? Can he come in for the day? Naturally. We'll set him up with swimwear, food, and rest in the basement quarters. It's still early. Feel free to explore while we plan for tomorrow.